in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, we read, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat, and as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Father, we thank you, Lord for this time together with you and one another. And even as, Lord, you had a teaching, a lesson for those disciples with you in that boat at that time, Lord, we know that you have a teaching for us today. May we understand it, Lord. Receive it and respond in faith that you are glorified and your people Proceed from this point forward, Lord, in your peace. We thank you and ask it in faith. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. So we need to break this down, and obviously there has to be something in this passage that pertains to us because we sang so many parallels this morning. Man lives by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. So we're going to see a direct connection between your lives here in this 21st century and the disciples' lives in the first century. And in order to do that, we're going to break down and take a real careful look at what the Lord recorded and, well, compare it to some other things that he taught us in Scripture. Let's start at the end of the passage this morning and answer the question that... They asked, but didn't know at that time, but could have and maybe should have if they knew the word of God. Keep your finger here. We're just going to turn briefly, but go to Psalm 104 with me, please. Going back to the left, to the middle of your Bible, to the 104th Psalm. And in Psalm 104... We're going to actually pick it up in verse 5 and get just a little bit of context. We're talking about someone. So let me read verse 5 and ask you the question, hey, who are they talking about here? Psalm 104, verse 5, the psalmist writes, you laid the foundations of the earth. Anybody have any insight on who's being referred to here? God, the creator, right? Okay, so we know who's in view. We're speaking about God so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with the deep, as with a garment, talking about the waters laying over the face of the earth. The waters stood above the mountains. Now look at verse 7, please. Speaking of the Lord, at your rebuke, they fled. Who are the they? they? The waters. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. Wow. Just a word from the Lord of rebuke and the waves have to stop. Even the waves have to obey the voice of the Lord. Is it possible that the word of God lays the foundation for every situation that the Lord knows we're going to go through? Well, no, it's not just possible. It's a biblical fact. And it's absolutely necessary, brothers and sisters, for us to live the life that Jesus bought and paid for. We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about salvation. Hey, how did Jesus define that in the Gospel of John chapter 17? 
Anybody remember when Jesus said, and this is eternal life? Yeah, it's, it's knowing the Lord, paraphrase. You can see that in John 17, verse 3. But the knowing is the, the experiential, the intimate of the oneness sort of thing. The two shall become one is our first reference to that concept expressed in Scripture. That's what the Lord has in mind. That's eternal life, not just knowing things that are true about Jesus and me doing my thing and him doing his thing. So I'm going to ask several more questions because I learned this from Jesus. The Lord uses this as a way to direct our attention in a helpful way to get us thinking about what he's pointing our attention to. He asked them some questions, but to, well, set the stage, let's look at the questions he asked in verse 40. To the disciples, right? Let's say the, the 12 on that boat, at least four of which we know were professional fishermen on their home turf, the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't some new place or something, right? But after the whole startling for them event, he asked them the question in verse 40, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Before we get on the boat with the disciples, let's, in our sanctified imagination, put ourselves there with Jesus. He's asking them a question that we've already demonstrated. That they're, they're relatively clueless. But he's asking them a question that he knows the answer to. He's trying to get them to think about it. He's asking them a question that I hope you already know the answer to. But if not, the Lord is directing our attention to it. Jesus asked the question, how is it that you have no faith? Now we have to be careful to explain when the Lord is talking about faith, he's talking about the faith that he wants, which is faith in him revealed by his word. Romans chapter 10 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, you have to grab this part. If you don't grab it today, you're going to get more opportunities to learn this and see the importance for it. When there's a situation in your life, there's something that God has already said that's necessary for the kind of relationship he wants with you. What you need to know is exactly what he has and is telling you in the specific situation. How is it that you have no faith? Well, I think you could insert yourself and say, well, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, well, did they have God's word in that situation? Did he sit down and give them a, a, a three-day verse-by-verse Bible study? No, but does God need to? Or does he just need to tell you what you need to know? And we need to trust him in that. Well, it's the last part. Sometimes I think that we kind of dig our feet in and say, well, I know the Lord said this, but I need some more information before I'm really going to commit to this trusting thing. Well, you can do that, but you won't experience what the Lord has. He gave them some instruction? No, he gave them his word. We read it and we look again in verse 35. Jesus said to those in the boat, let us cross over to the other side. Not a lot of words, but enough. We can start with what he didn't say. Let's give this a go and maybe we'll make it. No. Hey, let's start out and if you work really hard, you can get us there and maybe I'll kick in a little help. No, he just simply said, let us, and that us is important. Let means, oh, I'm going to allow it, and that's God's allowance. Us, the Lord and his people, the disciples, together, cross over to the other side. Now, I take this as a promise from the Lord. Even though it's not stated in the words that Jesus said, I promise you we'll make it to the other side. 
I don't think Jesus has to say, I promise you every time. And many of the promises don't include the word promise, but they are just as unbreakable. They're just as binding. We'll learn later if the Lord tarries in Hebrews that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We've already seen recently in our study in Malachi that God doesn't change. I am the Lord, I change not. We refer to that as the immutability or the unchanging nature of God. So if God says something, he's not like us. He doesn't, well, me, I know I said it, but you know things changed. No, let us cross over the side. In Jesus' mind, that was going to happen. So let's take it as a promise. And again, the Lord just taught us Wednesday night, hey, it's by faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God. That sets up our understanding for the way we would approach it if we got into that boat. I hope at least we could. We know from the Lord's writing in Peter that it's by God's precious promises we become partakers in the divine nature. Really take a moment and break that down. To be a partaker means you take part. You're an active participant. God's nature is God's business. What he's attempting, he's doing more than attempting, but what he's working at and accomplishing in us, he's making us like Jesus. So the Lord reveals to the mind that he's just informed, okay, the Lord's going to do it, but he's showing us his process. Oh, if God makes a promise, that's going to be the means that he uses to do his work, you know, the supernatural part, the part we can't do, which is everything. Our part is to believe, right? So if you have a word of God and it contains a promise, and they did, their part was to trust it and see something happen. Well, let's look at the other question Jesus asked. How is it that you have no faith? Well, they didn't have the faith because what? It's not that they didn't have his word. They didn't focus on it. What were they focused on? Well, you have to make a judgment call. What Jesus said is an established fact or promise, we're going to get to the other side. Or were they leaning on their own understanding? Jesus didn't think they were going to perish. His posture kind of demonstrates that. He said it, he went to sleep. It was finished, right? There's a strong parallel there to other biblical passages. But from their perspective, (laughs) do you not care that we're perishing? First off, that's a horrible indictment. Lord, do you not care about your disciples? Do you not care, Lord, about perishing people? Well, isn't there a pretty famous passage in Scripture that the Lord says that God so loved? Yeah, that he? That whomsoever? Shall not what? Yeah, no, I, I don't think we can rightfully even ask that question if you know God's word and you're focused. No, I know God cares about me and he's paid the ultimate price. So, so what's happening here? They're leaning on their understanding and they're reaping the rewards of that. Jesus was attempting to focus their attention on that when he asked them, why are you so fearful? Follow-up question, is fear a fruit of the Spirit or a work of the flesh? Okay. Absolutely correctly, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These guys were anxious and afraid. It was all them and none of the Lord. So pretty easy to diagnose this, right? Their failure to experience what Jesus was experiencing was a direct result of not putting their faith in God's word. Now, we're going to break that down a little bit more, but 
we have to see ourselves in the boat, if you will, I've entitled today's teaching, On Board with Jesus. Right? I'm sure there's probably a million other people that I don't know of a single one, but I want to make a careful distinction because I could have said, when Jesus is on board, but here's the deal. Jesus was on the boat, but that didn't seem to be working for them. The problem was they weren't on board with Jesus, and that's what we need to know. And to help ourselves, well, identify with their situation, I want to focus on a couple of promises that the Lord Jesus has made to you and every other brother and sister in Christ as a disciple. We've got a lot of them, but two of them are going to be really helpful. And I, I think you're going to see a direct parallel to their situation. First, Jesus said to them, right, let us cross over. I'm going to get you to the other side, in a sense. He didn't say that, but we, we know that that's exactly the Lord's perspective. Well, what has he told us as a Christian? The first one, we'll put it on screen from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. We read, the Holy Spirit writing to the church and for us, being confident. Oh, we're going to learn about we have need of confidence in our study in Hebrews at a later date. Being confident to this very thing. We'll talk about the thing, but don't miss this. Brothers and sisters, it's the Lord's perspective he wants you to have his confidence in his word, being confident to this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, we're talking about the Lord. If you are a Christian, it is because, well, he chose you in him before the foundations of the earth. He, he called, whom he called, he also justified, right? You were born again. He started the process. And from God's perspective, it's a done deal. Whom he justified, he also glorified. I'm going to get you there. He doesn't set himself to anything that he's not fully confident in himself he's going to accomplish. And he wants you to be a partaker in his confidence. So there it is, that he has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, this ongoing process in which you are well, currently living in. Whether you're aware of it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you embrace it or not, or whether you dread it, because I really hope you might be thinking you're not going to make a connection to these guys in this boat, because I don't like hairy, scary situations. Well, no one does, and that's not the Lord's exact point. But promise number one, just as Jesus said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side, he's going to make sure they get there. He's going to make sure you get there. But now you might be thinking, yeah, but did they know when they got in the boat that the storm was going to come up? No, but I know that Jesus did. He recorded it. didn't surprise him. He wasn't concerned about it. And we think about that very important metaphor, storms on the sea, that we talk about as an illustration for the troubles of your life. It's not just being in a boat, although it could be. Right? The Lord makes us another promise, and we're going to look in the book of Acts, and we'll put this up on the screen also, please. I think we have a couple verses here in Acts 14, 21, 22. Speaking of the apostles as they're ministering to the church, we get a little bit of just the history, the narrative. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, now I want to hold up here a minute because we're studying in the book of Mark and we can remind ourselves that Mark is a gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. The Lord says it, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Good news when you're in Jesus and they preach the kingdom of God. So we've been presenting this the way the Lord does. It's the good news of Jesus and his kingdom, the kingdom of God. So they're preaching the gospel to these guys, the good news of Jesus to that city and made many disciples. People were converted. You're converted so that you might grow. You're not just converted or born again so that 
Your sins can be forgiven and you can go do your own thing until you're, you know, hanging out in heaven on clouds eating wonderful chocolate and all the other things that are totally not biblical. Although I do hope they have healthy chocolate on the other side. Anyway, they made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Man, how does God do that? You're perfect just like you are, man. You're in Jesus. It's only going to get better. You can have your best life now. Mm, no, they, they preferred to honor God by telling the truth. And not just any truth, God's truth. Exhorting, encouraging them to continue in the faith. What does that mean? Think about the parable of the sower that we just looked at. The word goes out and there were four given reactions. Some, well, the... Uh, the word just you now didn't get it, right? Satan snatched away. Some believed until persecution. And then they fell away. They didn't continue to believe when the trial come, when the storm happened. Well, <laughs> it was a little bit like the, the guys on the boat, actually. Right? Do you not care that we're perishing? Well, the apostles were encouraging the disciples to continue in the faith. Don't bail out. Say goodbye to buffet Christianity. Ooh, I like this part. No, I don't like that. I'm going to have some more of this. No, it's, he sets the table before us in the presence of our enemies. And it's all good. It's all necessary for my health and growth and enjoyment. Exhorting them to continue in the faith. Their trust in everything that God tells them. And saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Quick, open book test. How many tribulations? Many. Far different than one and done, right? I showed an illustration, video format, before we started this teaching. I'm going to refer to it again. But... Many of you, if not most of us, have seen that story before and were reminded. And even more, I think, know the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And it starts out, When peace like a river attendeth my way, is there, pres is, is there attending to me? When sorrows like sea billows roll, another word for billows, waves, Triggering anything in your mind where that comes from? Oh, I, I heard you before you said it. Isaiah chapter 48. Keep a finger here, please. In the book of Isaiah, as we make our way there, chapter 48, and we'll just zero in on it specifically. The Lord is speaking to Israel. And in Isaiah, I'm still seeing some pages turning. I'm looking and I cannot find it. Excuse me? Isaiah 48, 18. Yes, thank you. Back it up to verse 17. Please. The Lord says to Israel, right, and through Isaiah the prophet, and you know by now that when the Lord is sending a spokesman, it's because God's people have turned away and the Lord's intention is to turn them back. The Lord's always trying to turn us back to him. Isaiah 48 and verse 17, thus says the Lord, Yahweh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I'm the Lord your God who teaches you to profit. God's teaching is for our benefit. Who leads you by the way you should go. It's an open invitation. God says, 
in their hearing. And you know this is our Father's heart. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Guys, if you just would have responded to my word in faith and trust, then my peace would be... No. Your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Now, a little bit of a turn when, when Spafford wrote that, but he wrote that as a Christian, right? I think he wrote it from the perspective of what we just saw in the book of Acts. Hey, there's going to be many tribulations. Think of it, well, as the ocean, wave after wave, right? And that follows in with exactly what the disciples said. Listen, Christian, our Father's perfect plan is that in this world, there's just going to be trouble after trouble, things that are going to be beyond your ability. Think of it like waves on the ocean, right? Any one of us go down to the coast and say to the sea, be still? No. Neither can you stop the troubles that are for your good. Now, here's a concept. Here's the part where a new Christian just says, I'm going back to the buffet and I don't want that. But God says, in this world, you will have tribulation. Right? Jesus said that the narrow way was difficult. But he also said that in him, he would have peace. He said if we're weary and heavy laden, we could find rest for our souls. So it's not one or the other. It's both at the same time. All the way back to the garden at the first fall when the Lord said after the unrepented rebellion of Adam, our great, great something ancestor, cursed is the ground for your sake. Picked up again in Romans. All creation was subjected to futility and hope. In hope of what? Well, simply in hope that in the difficulties we would find the Lord. Think about this. The kingdom of God is what Jesus lived and modeled and taught. It's a way to live here and now, not as citizens of the world, but as citizens of heaven. Different agenda, different resources, a different God working through the people. On that boat, in the Gospel of Mark, at that time, well, there was the king himself, there was his disciples. One of them was living as a subject of the kingdom. Guess who? The one sleeping on the pillow. The other 12 had not yet learned it, but they were in the Lord's school of discipleship. I'm going to send these things to you. And that's the way it was on that. I mean, you've got to understand from their perspective, four of these guys made their living on that sea. They had seen some storms before, but this one, no, this one's going to take us down. And actually, the water was coming in, so clearly we're going down. The threat was existential. It was there. It was real. Not to Jesus, only to someone who's, well, not of the kingdom of God. Those disciples had not yet learned to live this way. Sadly, much of what we see in Christianity, not in the Bible, but, you know, in the news or on TV that calls itself Christianity, doesn't model itself any differently. It has peace, well, like the world. Spafford wrote on the ocean, hey, difficulties. If, if you were really paying attention there, uh, had heard that. We heard that in the song, when sorrows like sea billows roll, trial after trial, the account said wave after wave of things happened to him. Man, he, he got hit financially. His real estate went out. Then his, his son died. Then his daughters died. And his wife was alone. It was just thing after thing. That's real. That might be worse than being in the boat. And then, because it was a different day and communication was different in a multi-day journey, he's crossing over the spot and he's been made aware. You can just kind of see the Lord working through that. It's like, 
how the captain, and I, I think this is the place, right? You're looking down. Oh my gosh. If you caught what the narrator said, Spafford said, it was the promises of God that began to shine in my heart. And what happened? He broke down sobbing in tears. No, he broke out in praise. There was something supernatural happened there. So if I can put us on the boat with the disciples as an illustration, you, by your father's perfect plan, have been guaranteed, have a promise of God that there's going to be trouble after trouble, not one and done, but many tribulations that will be beyond you, but not one of them beyond him. And you've got two ways to go about this. That's pictured in our text. One, like the disciples, ah, right? That's what I think I probably would have done in the flesh. They did something like, do you not care that we're perishing? And even when Jesus is speaking to them, they still didn't get it. Oh, excuse me, Lord. I know you mean your teeth. What was that? Who could this be, right? Wow. We could go through it like that. Why is God doing this to me? How can God really love me? Doesn't he know? Well, and I think most of us are further than that. Or we can go through it like Jesus. That's God's purpose. We need to understand the mechanism a little bit. It's something our Father has been really focusing our attention on. Jesus said, how is it that you have no faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When the next tribulation comes, maybe you're in it now. There's one thing primarily that you need to know to begin with. What is God saying to you specifically in that situation. Generalities are not going to cut it. Let me illustrate from the text. I've entitled the teaching On Board with Jesus. You can be going through a difficult situation that, man, it looks like it's going to take you out. Maybe it's going to. You're thinking, all you know is I'm going to be with Jesus. And that's, that's your hope and you're clinging to it. And what does that produce in you? It produces in you what we see as a brother or sister who's just beside themselves. Oh gosh, so pray for me, pray for me. I'm not, I am not saying anything negative about prayer, but I'm pointing out the importance of correct prayer. I would submit that they modeled something that was consistent with an incorrect prayer. Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? They're talking to God. No, that's not what he said in his word. Lord, we know that you care about us. There's something coming. Did I miss something that you want? That's a conversation that could have happened, but didn't. Oftentimes, when we as Christians are faced with these trials before we've been prepared to learn, to receive what the Lord is saying, our prayers are like this. The brother or sister just got this diagnosis. Pray that God delivers them out of it. Well, what do we mean by that? Oh, God, I'm in this. Help me. I'm Okay. But the Lord wants us to grow. Remember what he just taught us in Hebrews? Hey, let's leave the elementary principles. That's the foundation. But we need some more information. What does God's deliverance look like? Many of you are familiar with the quote from a brother who said that the Christian who is delivered from a trial will never grow like one who is strengthened to go through the trial. Since the Lord promises they're going to keep coming, and since I'm guessing you, like me, have already been in some significant situations where you cried out to the Lord, get me out of this, and it didn't happen, you might have been thinking, I know that he will never leave me nor forsake me. It's true, but it's not enough. What do I mean? Jesus was on board that boat. They got to the other side, just like you, Christian, are going to get to heaven, but what's it going to look like between right now and then? Panicked and freaked out, and most importantly, not pleasing to the Lord? Oh, no. Or at peace. 
That quote in Isaiah, God's desire for his people beginning with Israel, oh, that you would have just trusted me. Then peace like a river, peace like a river would have attended your way. What's one difference between a river and say a lake or a pond? They're both water, right? Well, shape maybe, but the word I would choose to use is flow. You go to a lake, the water is there, but it's just there. And it's contained. A river, on the other hand, is an unending, constant supply of water. That's what Jesus was demonstrating. When I trust in Jesus, when you and we together trust in the Lord, according to his specific word, something unnatural happens. Something supernatural happens. The Lord himself, the Holy Spirit, manifests or makes real, makes good on his promise. In me, you will have peace. Jesus knew what the Father's word was. He was enjoying the peace, independent of the storms. Had the disciples said, okay, no, he said he's going to get through us. It could have been an entirely different experience for them. And ultimately it was, they learned. I mean, we saw the apostles strengthening the others, encouraging them. You're going to go through a lot of things. I'm so thankful the Lord tells us that. Otherwise, you'd think there's something wrong. Many Christians do think there's something wrong until they learn to take the Lord at his word. Oh, okay, no, the Lord said it would happen. Now I need the rest of it. Lord, what are you telling me about this? I know you're going to get me to the other side. I'm talking about right now because I'm, I'm a little shaky here. Oh, wait a minute. Why is that? Why are you fearful? Because I'm leaning on my understanding? Okay, Lord, what did you say? Still, not enough. It's necessary, right? Remember those two maxims? It's time to trot them out here for us and remind ourselves by the Spirit of God. When the Lord shows us things and it's become fashionable to think, I attend Bible studies, I understand it, I'm good. But then when you're in the situation that happens, you're either A, in his peace, or you're not, depending how much you know about his word. Are you saying that knowing God's word is bad? Absolutely not. It's necessary. It's just incomplete. It's step one. The maxim I always use with you guys is this. Only those who know can grow. It's no guarantee because the second part is necessary. Only those who believe, not can, will receive. You have to apply by faith. When we do, the Holy Spirit manifests it. Why do I keep saying that? He makes it happen. Because the Lord says that, and we refer to it in Galatians, a fruit or a result of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. That's what Jesus had. That's what the disciples learned. That's what our Father's telling us today, church. You see the headlines. It's getting harder out there. You see the trials in the fellowship. Something's wrong. What, how are we praying? Well, how should we pray? We'll get to that. But don't miss the point. No one's making up anything here, but the Lord is rather pointing out a very important aspect of our relationship that he expresses over and over in scripture. We're here in Mark chapter 4. The disciples are learning the lesson on a boat. There's a lot of boat situations in scripture. Have you know that? Can you think of any where it's in scripture where, hey, a difficult time comes and God's people are in a boat and somehow if things go right, they're leading to salvation? Remember Genesis? Yeah, the ark, that's, that's kind of a well-known one, right? Well, there's, there's a key ingredient, but let's, let's think of a, a couple more here. How about in the book of Jonah, right? There's a storm, there's a boat, there's people in fear of their lives. How about in the book of Acts? Paul and a couple hundred folks and some Roman soldiers just off the coast of Malta people feared for their lives? What are the commonalities in those? Well, in every biblical boat success story, there's this. There's a real problem that's going to kill you. 
but there's God's word. And when it's believed, trusted, and responded to in faith, something supernatural happens, and God himself works out their deliverance. I think we're all familiar with the account of the ark. Let's think about Jonah. Wait a minute, God's word? Well, what did Jesus say about Jonah? What, a prophet? And actually, he was a sign, a type of Christ. There were the men, Jonah's trying to get away. A great storm comes out. They're all, they tried and tried to row. They couldn't get in there. They all think they're going down. God's word comes through God's spokesman, Jonah. Man, this is because of me. Throw me over the side. And they do, right? And then what happens? For those guys who obeyed the voice or the word of God through Jonah, it's the end of the storm for Jonah. It's the fish and on it goes, right? How about Paul? Many days. Many days. Nobody's eaten. The Romans are getting ready to kill all the prisoners. But God sends his word through an angel. And Paul tells everybody else, hey, a messenger of God stood with me this night. And he, he told me, God told me through his messenger, this is what's going to happen. Nobody's going to perish. Every life will be preserved, but the boat's going to get ruined. This is what you got to do. And they obeyed, and guess what? They were all saved. Over and over and over, God's specific word in that specific situation, responded to in faith, is the means that the Lord will use to accomplish his unique and supernatural, what only God can do, deliverance in that. Going through a trial today? No, well, you will be. But if you are, you need to know one thing. Again, generalities aren't going to get it. I've been there. The Lord kind of corrected me and said, it's not time for my personal stories. It's time for his. Here's the situation. Oh, Lord, I know you love me, and I know you'll never leave me, but I'm, I'm, I'm fearful. It's like, wait a minute. Father, what are you telling me here? What do you want me to know? Forgive me if you already told me. Oh, that's depending on the promises of God. For the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. He will bring to your remembrance the things that he's told you. When you trust him, the Lord responds. Now, this is kind of a judgment call on your part as we look at this response of Jesus to the disciples. Would you say that Jesus was pleased with them? Yeah, I mean, he doesn't say, oh, I'm so pleased with you. Or there seems to be like there's something else that Jesus wants for them and something they don't have, right? If you read other translations, they translate it as Jesus saying, why are you so cowardly? We never know the inflection, but the word. We know God's not down with cowards, right? That's not, that's not his spirit. That's not what he wants for us. I'm from the position that Jesus isn't pleased. Do we have any biblical support? He asked the question, how is it that you have no faith? <laughs> Where's your faith, right? What does the Lord teach us in Scripture? Without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? The just shall live by faith. Amazing that the Lord moved our brother to lead us in song with that. In the book of Hebrews, we're told, again, that the just shall live by faith. Every aspect of my relationship is dependent upon me knowing what God has said in this current situation and trusting that when I do, then the supernatural happens. I'm in his peace. And his results, his fruit get manifested through me. It looks a lot more like Jesus and nothing like Todd apart from Jesus. And so it is with you. Also in Hebrews, the Lord said, if anyone shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. What a contrast with that statement in Hebrews when you think about directions. I can either be saying, I know the Lord says this, but I don't think I want this. I'm shrinking back. You already know that you're not pleasing God. And guess what? There's going to be some teaching points. The chastening, which means discipline or child training, will happen. That's what they were experiencing. 
But chastening yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The Spirit of God said through Paul to the Philippian church, forgetting that which is behind, I press on. No shrinking back, but I'm pressing on to the prize. There's not the upward call of God. I'm getting closer to the Lord all the time. Ooh. And so the course is set before us. Now, there's a lot of boat stories in Scripture that we've talked about. But here's the thing. You don't have to be in a boat for this to apply. You have to be in a situation, a trial, which is a promise of God, a guarantee that's going to happen. And when it comes, there's the potential to be pleasing to God. It can only happen if you're seeking what he says. You got to go to him in faith. Father, tell me. He will. He'll keep you in his peace. That's how you know you're praying correctly. He'll reveal what you need to know when you need to know it. And as you trust, you're going to see the Lord affect his salvation. And remember, salvation's an ongoing process as growth is. You'll see the supernatural. Do we see that modeled anywhere else in Scripture? Well, yeah, here's one. We'll get to it later in Mark. But Jesus, as we learned, as our great high priest, right? He was tempted in all ways as we are, but yet without sin. Jesus experienced a real human reaction on a level I don't think any of us have when he was in the garden. As the Lord leads, please, with him, go back and look carefully at that. Break it down because we have the best illustration on how we are to approach the Lord. Because common sense tells us, right? Hey, if I'm going through a situation that God promises, I'm looking for the out. If he doesn't want me to go through it, I don't want to be there. Think about what Jesus prayed. Father, if there be any other way, right? Take this cup, this plan, this thing from me. So Jesus asks according to allowing for the possibility that it would be God's will that I'm seeing this thing and would it be an understatement to say Jesus was a little stressed out at this time? His sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood. Doctors tell us that the condition hematidrosis happens when a human body, Jesus isn't the only one this has happened to, is under so much stress that blood vessels rupture and it mixes in with your sweat ducts. And you'll see people literally sweating blood. Stress will do that. Jesus was there in his humanity. What did he do? Well, I'm going to ask, Lord, is there any other way? But then what did Jesus say? Yeah, but nevertheless, according to your will, and wasn't the Father's will revealed? Yeah. What did he tell his disciples? I've got to go there, Jerusalem. I've got to be handed over. They're going to scourge me. They're going to crucify me. Had his moment, checked in with the Father, and then, you know, we're not told, but we see the evidence of it. What happened next in the account? He kept sweating blood and, and crying out, and they carried him away as he sweat blood, and for the next day, no. As soon as Jesus said, as soon as he, as our model, <laughs> this is God's will. I'll put my trust in what the Father said. I'm going through with this plan. The storm stopped. There's no more account of the sweating blood, the stress. He gets up and he's ministering to his disciples at that point. That's something supernatural. Wasn't just the exclusive territory of Jesus. How about this one? We try to imagine ourselves in the boat with the disciples. Put yourself in a position where people hate you so much they're taking big rocks and they're throwing them at you until you're dead and there's no way out. What's your, what's your defense for that? What's your plan? Well, first one would be get out, right? But no, the Lord's got you in there. This isn't hypothetical. This is Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit who when people were doing that to them, right? Well, Scripture records the details. He's being literally stoned to death, hitting with rocks until he dies. He's, what is he 
I see heaven open. Jesus standing. And just like Jesus, the, the very character of Jesus is being manifested through him. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The same thing Jesus prayed. It doesn't say this in these words, but it describes it. Stephen's mind was set on things above. The Lord in his will, he's going to be receiving me. Right? And the Lord was providing and manifesting, well, his character. It's a clear counterpart to Jesus. The lesson for us, same, same, brothers and sisters. I think we should be challenged how we view the storms. In closing, here's kind of the last perspective that we're going to apply to the situation. Those 12 disciples in the boat, there were two perspectives in play. God's and man's, and they were disciples, right? They're the picture of us. You can respond this way. Or our perspective apart from what God says. They, the disciples who were frightened and didn't have the peace of God, were, well, they were looking at it from the bottom up. This is our situation, so now we need to call on God according to our understanding of the situation and get him to help. And the Lord does graciously help them. The whole training session ended right there, but another one was waiting in the wings. And we'll see that, just as another one's waiting in the wings for us. You want to pass these things the right way. Because the Lord is very good about the retraining sessions. But instead of looking at it from the bottom up, we're told, we're trained, we're being taught, we're learning to look at this from the top down. The Lord gave me the, the saying years ago that when I look at it from his perspective, I use about any given situation. Hey, this isn't going to sink the ship. There's a trouble in the church. Oh, that's gonna, this is going to be the end of his church. No, that might be my perspective or our perspective, but it's certainly not his perspective. For he said he'd build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. That's not taking the ship down. But wait a minute, everybody's troubled. Everybody's undone. What is it? We're looking at it from our perspective. And maybe we're, we've called a special prayer meeting. Oh God, this is what you got to do. Well, Lord, we're asking deliverance from this if it's in accordance with your will. But Father, you've taught us, what is it that you're telling us? What is your perspective on this situation? Oh, they went out from us because they're not of us. Oh, that's not the spirit, that's the flesh. I could go, oh, for a long time and so could you. But the point is this. It's what he's saying about the situation. And when you have it and you accept it, that's the next big thing, and you trust it, that's when, and that's only when, you begin to experience what only he can do, beginning with his peace. And the end, well, the Lord says, the salvation of your souls. Amen? Yes. Father, we thank you again, Lord. Every song you picked, Lord, focused us on you. It put the emphasis that our life this relationship that you bought and paid for and made available through faith in your son is to be lived by faith. Lord, you're reminding us yet again that faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. Lord, you have given us your word today. We have seen in the passage where the disciples didn't learn it at that time. Lord, we saw later that they ultimately did. But my prayer, Father, is that we take from here today everything that can happen that would be pleasing to you. Lord, that you would be well pleased to see the response of faith in your people, Lord, that you provide. Father, I ask in accordance with your perfect will and your kindness and goodness towards us. There are so many situations even now, Father, if your people don't have your word, would you please, by your spirit, guide them into it? Would you remind all of us, Lord, if we're not in a situation now that one is coming and you've designed it, you've guaranteed it, Lord, that it would be 
for your glory and our good. Father, please remind all of us by your spirit that you've said these things very clearly to the church in the book of Romans and the book of James, Lord, that we're to rejoice in the midst of these trials knowing that it's accomplishing your will to produce Christ in us. Lord, have your way. Build your church, and Father, I pray, use us fully for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen? Shall we stand and sing his praises?